How I Use Truth, Chapter 9, Trusting and Resting. There is a perfect passivity that is not indolence. It is a living stillness born of trust. Quiet tension is not trust, it is simply compressed anxiety. Who is there among those who have learned the law of good and have tried to bring it into manifestation, who has not at times felt his or her physical being almost ready to snap with the intensity of holding to the truth? You believe in omnipresent life. You attempt to realize it for others. Someone comes to you for help. One who is always in a hurry for results, always wanting to know how much more time will be required and so forth. So the person's impatience and unbelief, together with your great desire to prove the law to him, stimulate you after a few treatments to greater efforts and almost immediately you find yourself thinking frequently of the person when not treating and trying to throw more force into the treatment when the person is present. Then, after giving a treatment, you find a sense of fullness in your head that is very uncomfortable, and very soon what at first was a delight to you becomes a burden, and you almost wish the patient would go to someone else. You cannot help wondering why the person improved so perceptibly with the first few treatments, and afterward, even with your increased zeal, seemed to stand still and get worse. Let me tell you why. When you first begin to treat, you, so sure of the abundance of divine life, calmly and trustly spoke the truth to your patient. When the person got in a hurry, you, beginning to take on responsibility that was God's, not yours, grew anxious and began to cast on him your compressed anxiety. You were no longer a channel for the divine life, sweet, peaceful, harmonious, to flow through. But by your intensity and hurry, you completely shut off the divine influx and were able only to force on the person. Out of your anxious mortal mind, if you strained compulsory thoughts that held him as in a vice and exhausted you. Some healing and other demonstrations of power are brought to pass in this way, but it is always the strong mortal thought controlling the weaker, and is always wearing to the one thus working. This plane is entirely one of mental suggestion, a mild form of hypnotism. In the matter of God, as our supply or any other side of the divine law that we, from time to time, attempt to bring into manifestation, the moment we begin to be anxious, our quiet becomes simply the airtight valve of tension or suppressed anxiety that shuts out the very thing we are trying to bring about and so prevents its manifestation. This way of holding with intensity to a thought, be it mental argument for healing or looking to God for material supply, recognizing that we have power by such firmness of thought to bring what we want into manifestation, is one way of obtaining results, but it is a hard way. We therefore give out what is within us, and it is helpful so far as it goes. But by some mental law, this intensity of thought seems to cut off our consciousness from the fountainhead, thus preventing inflow and renewal from God, resulting in the quick exhaustion and the burdened feeling. We need to rise above this state of tension to one of living trust. There is such a thing as an indolent shifting of our responsibility to an outside God, which means laziness, and which never brings anything into manifestation. But there is also a state of trustful passivity into which we must enter to do the highest work. There are some things that we are to do ourselves, but there are others that God does not expect us to do. When I speak of ourselves as something apart from God, I simply mean our conscious selves. We are always one with God, but we do not always consciously realize it. I speak of ourselves as the conscious part of it. They are His part, and our greatest trouble lies in our trying to do God's part just because we have not learned how to trust God to do it. We are, with our conscious thought, to speak the words of life, of truth, of abundant supply, and we are to act as though the words were true. But the bringing it in to pass is the work of the power that is higher than we, a presence that we do not see with these mortal eyes, but which is omnipotent and will always rush to our rescue when we trust it. From the smallest thing of our everyday life to the rolling away of the largest stone of difficulty from our path, this presence will deliver us but its working depends on our trusting, and trusting means getting still inside. In our effort to bring into manifestation the good that we know belongs to every child of God, it is when we get beyond the point where we are trying to do it all ourselves and let God do His part that we get the desires of our heart. 
After we have done our part faithfully, earnestly, we are told to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. The Lord shall fight for ye, and ye shall hold your peace. See the conditions here imposed. This invisible presence will remove from your path the difficulties which look to your mortal vision to be almost insurmountable. Only if you stand still, the Lord will fight for you if you hold your peace. But there is no promise of deliverance for you while you per persevere a state of unrest within. Either a state of internal unrest or of a forced external quiet, which simply means compressed anxiety, prevents this invisible omnipotent force from doing anything for your deliverance. It must be peace, peace. Possess your soul in peace and let God work. Marvelous have been the manifestations of this power in my life when the bringing to pass has been left entirely to it. Ask not, then, when or how or why. This implies doubt. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. When in the reign of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, the Ammonites, Moabites, and others, a great multitude came against the king in battle, he in great fear called the people together, and they sought counsel of the Lord, saying, we are powerless against this great multitude that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, and he said, Listen, all Judah. Thus say the Lord to you, Do not fear or be dismayed at this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. This battle is not for you to fight. Take your position, stand still, and see the victory of the Lord on your behalf. Tomorrow go out against them, and the Lord will be with you. My friend, the battle you are trying to fight is not yours, but God's. You are trying to heal. You are trying to hold vigorously to the law of good in that every trouble at home that the world knows not of, but with it times nearly overwhelms you. Be still, let go. The battle is God's, not yours, and because it is God's battle through you, God desiring to manifest through you, victory was on your side before the battle began. In your consciousness, for that is the only place where there is any battle. Can you not calmly, even with rejoicing, claim the victory right now, because it is God's battle? You need no longer fight this battle, but stand still, right where you are today in the struggle to overcome material things, and see the victory of the Lord on your behalf. Does some doubting Thomas say, Yes, but I must have money today, or I must have relief at once, or the salvation will come too late to be of any use, and besides, I do not see how. Stop right there, dear friend. You do not have to say how. That is not your business. Your business is to stand still and proclaim, It is done. God said to Josephat, Tomorrow go out amongst them. That is, they were to do calmly and in order the external things that were in the present moment to do. But at the same time, they were to stand still or to be in a state mentally of trustful passivity and see God's saving power. Jehoshaphat did not say, But Lord, I do not see how, or Lord, I must have help right away or it will be too late, for already the enemy is on the road. We read, They rose early in the morning, and as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, O Judah. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. And then he appointed singers who should go forth before the army, singing, Give thanks to the Lord, for his steadfast love endures forever. All this, and not yet any visible sign of the promised salvation of the Lord, right into the very face of battle against an army mighty in number, singing, Give thanks to the Lord. Are you any nearer than this to the verge of the precipice in this material condition that you are trying to overcome? What did Jehoshaphat do? Did he begin to think or pray hard and forcibly? Did he begin to send strong thoughts of defeat to the opposing army and exhaust himself with his efforts to hold on to the thought until he should be delivered? Did he begin to doubt in his heart? No, not at all. He simply remembered that the battle was God's and that he had nothing to do with the fighting, but everything to do with the trusting. Further on we read, as they began to sing in praise, the Lord set an ambush against the Ammonites, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, so that they were routed. It was only after they began to sing and to praise the Lord made the first visible move toward the manifestation of His promised salvation. 
It may be so with you. You may be at the very verge of apparent failure in the overthrow of the cherished principle. Your friends are already beginning to speak despairingly of you, of your foolish trust, saying, You must do something in this matter. Fear not. Just try to realize that the battle is God's through you, that because it is God's battle it has been victory from the start and can never be anything else. Begin to sing and praise God for deliverance, and assuredly as you do this, giving no thoughts to the when or the how, the salvation of the Lord will be made visible, and the deliverance as real as it was in Jehoshaphat's case, even to the gathering of unexpected spoils, will follow. For this narrative of Judah's king further says, When Judah came to the watchtower of the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude. They were corpses lying on the ground. No one had escaped. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take the booty from them, they found livestock in great numbers, goods, clothing, and precious things, which they took for themselves until they could carry no more. They spent three days taking the booty because of its abundance. So God delivers when fully trusted, perfectly fully, even beyond anything we have asked or thought, adding good that we have never dreamed of, as though to give double assurance of God's favor and love to any who will trust God. This is the victory of the Lord on your behalf when you stand still. We must learn that the time of help coming to us is not our part but God's. We do, know, we do know that in all the accounts in Scripture of those who realize God's special deliverance from their troubles, from Abraham going forth to sacrifice his son to the time when Jesus put his hand to save the sinking and faithless Peter, And even after this, in the experience of the apostles, this invisible power came to hand, just at the right time always, never a moment too late. The promise is, God will help when the morning dawns, or as the Hebrew reads, at the turning of the morning, which means the darkest moment before dawn. So if in whatever you are trying to exercise trust in the Father, the way grows darker and the help goes further away instead of coming into sight, You must grow more peaceful and still than ever, and then you may know that the moment of deliverance is growing near with your every breath. In Mark's account of that early morning visit of the woman to the tomb of Jesus, when bent on an errand of loving servants, they forgot the immense stone lying across the path until they were almost at the journey's end, and then one exclaimed in momentary dismay, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. It is not very large, fully of meaning. The very greatness of the difficulty that made it impossible for the woman to remove it was the more reason why it was done by this invisible power. Man's extremity is God's opportunity. The more we are cut off from the human help, the greater claim we can make on divine help. The more impossible a thing is to a human or mortal power, the more at peace we can be when we look to the Lord for deliverance. For the Lord said, My power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul, realizing that when he placed less confidence in the mortal, he had more help from the divine, said, Whenever I the mortal am weak, then I am strong. 2 Corinthians 12.2 Trusting means resting confidently. We are to rest confidently, saying, God is my strength, God is my power, God is my assured victory. I will trust in him, and he will bring it to pass. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Psalm 37, 4 It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Psalm 118, 9 Those of steadfast mind you keep in peace, in peace because they trust in you. Isaiah 26.3 End of chapter